This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermi Sheikh, who are broadcasting from inside the UN Climate Summit here in Madrid, Spain. In the last few days of this climate summit that people are calling a cop-out, that we inside the climate summit have seen mass protests here, and yet still it limps along. And outside, the number of people who are so affected by the climate catastrophe. A new study finds that the climate crisis is already leading to a massive increase in the number of refugees being displaced around the world. In Berkeley, California, we are joined by Hussein Ayazi, policy analyst with the Global Justice Program at the Othering and Belonging Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. He's the co-author of the new report, Climate Refugees, The Climate Crisis and Rights Denied. And still with us here in Madrid is Salim ul -Haq, climate scientist and the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh. He's advising the bloc of least, developing, least developed countries here in the climate negotiations. So, Hussein Ayazi, could you lay out uh, what you found in this report on climate refugees? How many are there? What countries are the worst affected? Yes. So. <clears throat> uh, we're finding in the report that uh, permanent and short-term displacement due to the climate crisis is only increasing. Uh, in 2018, for example, of the 28 million new displaced persons, over 17 million were displaced due to weather-related natural disasters. And uh, these displacements were by and large across the global south. Uh, one need only look to the droughts in Pakistan, the floods in India, in Nigeria, the uh, crop failures and droughts in the Central American Dry Corridor that was behind the Central American uh, migration uh, caravan, the migrant caravan um, that dominated news cycles last year. And the second finding in the report is that although we generally refer to climate-induced displaced persons as climate refugees, this is actually not a legally recognized term, as in this is not a term within international uh, refugee protections. And in fact, the uh, UN High Commissioner for Refugees does not officially endorse the term climate refugees. Um, and, and this is really emblematic of the issue at large in that across international refugee law, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and other bodies of law, uh, protections for uh, climate refugees are limited, piecemeal, and by and large not legally binding. So you were here, is that right, Hossein Ayazi? No, I was not at COP. Uh, but some of your colleagues were. This issue of climate mm -hmm. refugees right now, how does what's happening inside the UN Climate Summit affect um, what's happening outside? This discussion you, we're having with you about climate refugees, and if you can talk more about, for example, what you mean by petro-persecution. Sure. So I'll start with your second question, in that petro-persecution is the, the main notion that we're advancing within the report. Uh, and it's, it's a term, uh, basically, we've identified a major barrier in negotiations toward uh, refugee protections for climate refugees. Um, in order to obtain refugee status, one need cross international borders due to a, uh, a, a, a real risk of persecution on the basis of one's race, ethnicity, religion, uh, other circumstances. Um, but this, uh, this, this notion of persecution within refugee law assumes that the source of persecution, the actor, the persecutor, uh, is either one's country of origin, the government, or internal to one's country of origin. And uh, this is not uh, how uh, forced migration under the climate crisis works. Um, in fact, uh, when, we, when we think of forced migration under the climate crisis, it's, it's fundamentally impossible to uh, tie a specific climate-related uh, natural disaster to a specific act of persecution. Um, 
uh, whether it's corporation, fossil fuel corporations, or, uh, or fossil fuel dependent industrial processes. Um, additionally, many of the, uh, the, the countries that are uh, at, at greatest risk of the effects of the climate crisis are in fact working hard to protect their own populations, to keep them in place, to ensure that they have the livelihoods to, to remain in place. And so what we're trying to do with this notion of petro persecution is one, delink the notion of persecution from territory. Uh, by that I mean uh, the climate crisis is a global phenomenon and so we need to recognize it as such within international refugee law. And the second, notion, the second uh, thing that we want to advance within this notion of petro persecution is that, um, is that the actor of persecution is actually our global dependence upon fossil fuels and the global investment patterns behind this dependence. And Hussein, your report doesn't just look at climate refugees in the sense of people who are forced to flee across borders, but also uh, at people who've been forced to flee their homes within uh, countries, internally displaced people. Could you talk about that? What did you find? How many people are affected and where? Yes, so uh, by and large, most migration uh, due to the climate crisis and most migration, most forced migration in general is internal. And, uh, and this is something that we state clearly in the report and that, uh, and that is actually uh, people displaced internally do have the, the, um, the, the uh, legally recognized uh, ability to, to uh, gain res uh, ability to resettle within uh, their country of origin and, and stay put. And, and the issue that we found in the report is that uh, while, while internally displaced peoples do have uh, the means to, um, for, for recourse and redress in, in some way or another, that this is not at all the case for peoples forced to cross international borders. Uh, so when we discuss refugees, uh, um, whether climate refugees or not, um, we're really talking about uh, movement across international borders and how uh, as certain island nations, for example, are at risk of complete inundation or uh, desertification makes entire countries potentially inhabitable, that people are forced to flee their country and that there's no place for them to resettle uh, at home. Um, and this is the major gap in international refugee law that we're, uh, that we're uh, shining a light on. And food refugees? Yes, yeah, so this notion of food refugees is one that we are using to define people or uh, communities displaced due to uh, growing food insecurity. And this can be due to a number of dynamics. This, is, uh, this could be due to land grabs or natural resource grabs, uh, seed monopolies, uh, international free trade agreements, uh, basically what people might describe as the corporate food regime or, uh, or corporate food system. Uh, and this structural vulnerability that uh, that communities face as a result of this um, this larger system uh, actually intersects with the climate crisis in the sense that um, w natural disasters uh, exacerbated by the climate crisis um, uh, force people to to already force already vulnerable peoples uh, to to search elsewhere for uh, sustainable livelihoods. And so, while we recognize that the term uh, climate refugee is different from food refugee. The, the two are really uh, interrelated and, um, and need be recognized as, as, uh, as both distinct categories, yet, yet fundamentally inseparable. Very quickly before we end, Salim Mohawk, uh, this year we're in Madrid, Spain. Next year, Glasgow. Um, what do you expect to happen in this time? Or does it even matter what happens here? Is it the action in the streets, the only thing that makes a difference, like the young climate activists by the millions going on school climate strike, demanding that their leaders pay attention. I think it still matters. Action. I think it does matter because this is where the leaders are. This is where the leaders are negotiating. They have to listen to their own kids who are out on the streets shouting at them and telling them that they're ruining their own kids' future. So we are still hopeful that they will listen. Between now and Glasgow, we hope we'll get a result in Madrid that will, on the particular issue that I'm concerned about, get a, a funding mechanism for loss and damage opened up for discussion, so which we can come back to in Glasgow and see whether or not we can actually make it happen. We're not asking for it to happen here. We're asking for it to be allowed to be happen next year in Glasgow. 
we're hopeful that we might get that. Well, we want to thank you both so much for being with us. Salim al -Haq, climate scientist, director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, and Hussein Ayazi, policy analyst and co-author of the new report, Climate Refugees, the Climate Crisis and Rights Denied. We'll link to that report at democracynow.org. That does it for our coverage right here on site at the 25th United Nations Climate Change Summit. We want to say special thanks to our crew right here in Madrid. But we'll let them speak their own names in their own words. Pablo Fernández. Antonio Herrera. Irene Briones. Jesús Parreño. Carlos Vargas. Luke Mylander. Ramón Ausan. Daniel Gómez Núñez. And, and thank you also to the crew who helped us with our live crew last Friday from Ocumbre, uh, Social and Climate, Ana Galatea Marina Panuelas and Van Daniel Vasquez, and to the Democracy Now! crew here on the ground in Madrid, Libby Rainey, Carla Wills, Nermeen Sheikh, John Hamilton, Hani Masood, Trina Nadura, Laura Gadisdina, Maria Tarasena, Julia Thomas, Adriano Contreras, Dennis Moynihan, and Maria Carrion. Special thanks to Julie Crosby, welcome back, and to Miriam Barnard, and a very welcome to the world to Maliki. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen. Thank <laughs>